Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with author Peter Chexfield. He's written many books, including the one I have in my hand called Having a Rave Up, a definitive guide to the British beat albums in the 1960s. Uh, Peter, welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, Peter, this book that I have in my hands is one of the most comprehensive um, album books I have ever ever touched in my life. And I, I have to say that it's quite a testimony to uh, the hard work that you put in. Tell me, tell me what went into this and what gave you the idea to come up with this kind of a book? Uh, I, I wrote several books before that on music TV, music TV shows throughout the 60s and 70s. And uh, for a long time, I'd wanted to do something like this. And uh, I just wanted something different during the, the, the height of COVID, really. And I started listening to some of my old albums, making notes. And I thought, you know, perhaps, perhaps there's a book in this. And yeah. 18 months later, there was. So. Yeah, and there's there's so many, though. I mean, like, it, there's a lot of bands that were big in England that were not big in the U.S. And, you know, like, I, I was looking through this. and I'm just looking, my goodness, uh, you know, there's, there you, you go, um, you know, the Caravels, for example. I mean... You could just go on and on and on. Was there any particular uh, research that you did in there that was, was harder than other research? Did you have to really put in a little more time to make sure all the details were um, all tied up? Some of the more obscure ones, the difficulty was actually listening to them, you know, tracking down, I don't know, Mandy and the Girlfriends as an album, not particularly good album, actually, but, uh, but trying to track down things like that and, uh, you know, to actually listen to them. But, uh, but a lot of them already had on CDs and, uh, buy an old, a few hours like to buy on mp3s or whatever so yeah any particular favorites peter that uh you know that are kind of under the radar for you um you know like when you look back on this book and you look back in the 60s um do you think there was a lot of a lot of great stuff that would bubbled under the top 40 that you felt that probably should have been a bigger hit than it was oh absolutely uh uh, PJ Proby, not particularly known in the uh, USA, but his first album recorded in the UK was absolutely fantastic. Really is, uh, you know, very versatile as well. I mean, it sounds like James Brown one minute, moment is impersonating Brian Wilson the next moment. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Uh, I am PJ Proby album, uh, and the Shadows as well. Uh, the UK's prime instrumental group, I suppose. Uh, the nearest equivalent in the USA probably be someone like the Ventures, but the, the Shadows did some really good stuff. Yeah, um, here's another guy I found, um, Heinz, you know. Oh, yeah, Heinz, interesting character. Uh, produced by Joe Meek, uh, 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 quite well known uh, in, in, at the time in the UK. He produced, uh, his best known recording that he did produce, which was a big success in the USA, was Telstar by the Tornadoes. And the Tornadoes were Heinz backing band as well. And Heinz was, well, he was part of the Tornadoes and they become his backing band. Then, yeah, there's, there's personnel changes. Yeah, so. yeah, he did, uh, well, you know, the tribute to Eddie Cochran, who is one of the great American rock and roll uh, icons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, the, the sound between um, the Mersey beat and, and London, very, very different sound. You know, uh, you had Jerry and the Pacemakers, you had uh, the Beatles, of course, you know, um, you know, so on and so forth. Um, how would you, how would you, for somebody who doesn't know the music of England uh, at that time period, how would you describe the difference between, um, you know, the sounds of the two areas of, of the UK? Most of the London bands tend to, tend to be a lot tougher. Even the so-called pop bands, like the Dave Clark Five, you know, a very tough band. Uh, I suppose the, the, the only uh, equivalent in London in the very early days and never really made it in the States until uh, later, Brian Paul and the Tremolos, they had a similar Mersey-type sound, but otherwise, obviously, you had the Yardbirds and the Kinks and the Rolling Stones and the Pretty Things, the Down Line of Six, but a very rhythm and blues uh, orientated. I've all, often found it strange how, why is the... Uh, you know, um, Liverpool was a rougher area than London and these rough clubs, but they never really got into uh, rhythm and blues in such a way. They had more pop influence, you know. I mean, I love Jerry and the Pacemakers, I love the Beatles, but you know, it, interesting that uh, it was in London that, that all that happened. Yeah, it was a larger metropolis and maybe, you know, the, the outskirts, would, I think Liverpool was about, what, 180 miles away from, from London and... Uh, Maybe the, you know what it was. I thought that London or Liverpool, they got all the records from America, you know, from from the uh, sailors, and, and it was just they were just interpreting the sounds that they got, and then and then making their own sounds from that. 
Oh, very much so. And, uh, and probably my, more diverse influences, you know, like the girl groups and Marvelettes and, uh, you know, people like that uh, and, and, and the early Motown stuff. And, uh, and obviously the Beatles, you know, a lot of musical and even, you know, uh, I, I don't know, all, all sorts of Ella Fitzgerald, people like that, you know, jazz. You know, mm-hmm. so. Which, yeah. is, which is great, yeah, and it all, all came together and created something new. So, Yeah, it, it is kind of, you know, it's kind of odd when you look back at it. Um, you have uh, kids from England are, are, are listening to our R&B and our jazz, and they're able to take all that in and then make it again, and I'll sometimes make it better. Yeah, and uh, and obviously it went backwards and forwards. You know, the the, uh, the British group influenced the birds and the Beach Boys and people like that, you know, and, and, and vice versa. You know, it's interesting the way, you know, the influence, you know, go across the channel, but then become something new again. We're talking to Peter Chexfield. The book is Having a Rave Up, and I would highly recommend this to anybody who is interested in rock and roll and learning more about uh, bands from England that you, if you think you know England's music in the 1960s, Check this book out first, because I'm guaranteed there's a lot of stuff in here you uh, probably have never heard of before, and it's all really, really good. Give me some, uh, Peter, give me some obscure bands from England uh, in this book that we may not be aware of. The Downliner Sect, you ever heard of them? No. Uh, they, they were similar to the Pretty Things, the Pretty Things for, for people who, who don't, don't know. They were like a rougher, tougher version of Rolling Stones. But the downline of sect was somewhere between the pretty things and the kinks, you know, very rough and ready, very rough, but uh, but in a fun sort of way. And very skiffle influenced. They were influenced by uh, Lonnie Donegan, who was uh, uh, very big over here in the 50s and very influential. So it was like a cross between uh, Lonnie Donegan and Chuck Berry, if you like. You know, so, you know, so that's that's one name, definitely. So, uh, Give me another one. Lulu. And Lulu. Uh, I mean, you, 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 you know Lulu for uh, yeah. to, serve, to Serve With Love, but she had a lot of hits before that and after that in the UK. I mean, you know, she's, she's the female star in, in this country. But her, her early stuff was, was, was uh, very rough, you know, very rough and ready. You know. yeah. It was rhythm blues. It wasn't pop. It was raw rhythm and blues. And she was only 15 years old at the time. So Lulu is someone, you know, I think more people should investigate her early, her early stuff. I like her. I saw her on Ready, Steady, Go, and she did a, a version of Shout that was, I thought, uh, very, very good. Yeah, that was her first hit uh, in this country, yeah. And uh, and she was on TV uh, over Christmas uh, performing Shout in, in this country on a show hosted by Jules Holland. And uh, I don't know how old she is now, 68, 69, something like that. And, yeah. and her voice is exactly the same. She's absolutely fantastic. You know, she's really kept it. So. Yeah, you know, speaking of that, uh, another great female star, my favorite uh, British singer of all time was Petula Clark, or is Petula Clark, and I thought, and I saw her a couple of years ago in uh, in the Cleveland area, and I thought her voice sounded beautiful, still the oh, same. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, she's still in very good shape, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you think about Petula Clark's career, all the way back to the 40s, uh, stretching through the stuff that Tony Hatch wrote for her in the 1960s and beyond, and, and her acting, yeah. and uh just quite amazing. Uh, oh, it really is. Was. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, she she connected, you know, almost, you know, just the immediate post-war era to 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 the beat era, and 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 like you say, beyond, you know, way beyond. So, yeah. Not not to mention too much of the obvious, but the Rolling Stones, um, you know, they're just plastered everywhere in the 1960s, along with the Beatles. And I don't want to uh, dwell too much on the Rolling Stones, but give give me your um, some of the favorite stuff that the Stones put out that may not be is recognizable commercially, uh, in your opinion? Well, possibly so my stuff. all-time favorite album in the, in the in the entire book, "Between the Buttons" by the Rolling Stones, their early 1967 album. And uh, I know the Rolling Stones themselves don't particularly like it, but it's uh, they're very influenced by British bands at the time, like the Kinks and the Small Faces. And Brian Jones, you know, he plays about a dozen instruments on it. It really is Brian Jones' album. And uh, yeah, Between the Buttons, I think, is an absolutely incredible album. I really do, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I love I love the Rolling, Rolling Stones now. I love everything they've done. I, every album's got its highlights to me. But 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 to me, it, you know, they peaked, you know, 60, 65, 66, 67. You know. Yeah. And, and I know most people disagree. They like the 68, 69, 70, 71, but uh, not for me. I agree with you. I, I really like the early stuff. I like um, the covers that they did uh, round and around by Chuck Berry, you know, the cover. And I, I like some of that really early stuff. Uh, 
Uh, round yeah. and Around by Chuck, uh, their version. I, I, I think it's one of the few Chuck Berry songs that they, they bettered. You know, there's no, I love Chuck Berry. I absolutely idolise Chuck Berry. I really do. But uh, but Round and Around, you know, Chuck Berry's original sounds almost like a demo, but the Rolling Stones, you know, it really wipes the floor with it. it really yeah. Does. They they really um, like walking the dog. The Rufus Thomas song. Their their yeah. version of walking the dog was better actually. Yeah, and the and a lot of people don't know the uh, the harmony vocal on that, or the, the uh, or almost a duet vocal is Brian Jones. It's not Keith Richards. That, you know that that raspy walking the dog uh, singing along to with Mick Jagger. That's one of the few where you can really hear Brian Jones singing. Right, right. Yeah, you know, speaking of Brian Jones, there's a guy that had so much talent who did so many things. And it just seems like he just, you know, through drugs, fell right off the face of the earth and he could have been so much more. Oh, absolutely. Uh, something I, I read in one book, I can't, can't even remember where, but uh, they said the, the biggest, the best tribute Keith Richards did for Brian Jones was becoming Brian Jones. It was, it was only after Brian Jones died that Keith Richards really got onto the hard drugs and, and the, and the debauched li lifestyle. And he almost you know, replaced Brian Jones as the, the rebel. But yeah, but in the 60s, it was Brian. It was, it was Brian who was doing all this, all, you know, the womanizing and the drugs you know, and everything else. And, 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 and an innovator as well. Cool. Right, right. Um, Peter Chexfield, our special guest. We're talking, um, I'm in Cleveland, Ohio, and Peter is uh, in the UK. Peter, what city are you in right now? I'm in Burgenton, Kent. Uh, for, for US uh, listeners, it's about 20 miles from Dover, the White Cliffs of Dover, which is probably about 60, 70 miles from London. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, I have an album behind me, and I want you to talk a little bit about this one. This is uh, Lady Godiva by Peter and Gordon. Peter Asher was recently in Cleveland, and I uh, interviewed him on my radio program. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Peter, uh, what a great guy. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, some of the great Peter and Gordon stuff that, other than A World Without Love. Uh, there was one album in particular that, that the, uh, I really can't think of the title, uh, in, in Nashville. It wasn't actually released in the UK, but they, they recorded it in Nashville in 1966. And uh, I mean, they sound like the Everly Brothers on it. They really do. You know, right. I've, I've played that to people. I've got some friends who are into 50s rock and roll, and they dismiss all this, all the British 60s stuff. And I've played them a couple of tracks, and they say, what do you think of this? I said, oh, the Everly Brothers, great. I said, no, it's Peter and Gordon. And they're like, what? <laughs> they, and and yeah, that's what yeah, I like. Yeah, their, their Nashville album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great when you see an act that is known for one thing that's able to go and do something entirely different. And Absolutely. pull it off, make it sound yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But very underrated, Peter and Gordon. Yeah, like like you say, a lot of people think of yeah, a world without love. But yeah, and and that track, Lady Godiva, it was first recorded, as far as I recall, on an album by Paul Jones, a Paul Jones solo album. Right. And uh, and Paul Jones hated it actually, but uh, but uh, yeah, Peter and Gordon then, then covered it, and they're the one who had the worldwide hit with it. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's kind of a novelty song, but but they pull yeah. it off, and it was in 1967, and the times and the music was changing and it would kind of fit into the almost like uh, the Winchester Cathedral type of music, yeah, uh, you know, that era, you know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I want to bring up another group that I thought, in my opinion, was grossly underrated. And I, and other than their hits, they had so many other uh, great body of music, the searchers. Oh yeah. The searchers. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Uh, well, a little, well, not quite a plug, but the, the last album I did was uh, On Top of the Pops, was a well-known uh, TV show in the UK. But I got a few quotes from people, but I, I managed to get nice quotes from both Mike Pender and uh, Frank Allen of The Searchers. And you know, The Searchers, they went their separate ways in 1986. There's two bands, but uh, but but they both uh, you know, talk very fondly in the early early days, they do. And uh, yeah, The search, Searchers are fantastic. Yeah. And, um, and Mike Penn's is still out there. He's, he's still touring. Yeah. Really, yeah. yeah. He's still good as well. So. Yeah. There, there's their version of when, uh, when you walk in the room, I, oh, I, yeah. I yeah. love that riff and that. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the shadows. Um, Cliff Richard and I've, you know, I, I'm a huge instrumental fan cause I'm, I was uh, friends with Dick Dale when he was alive and he was a great uh, king of the surf guitar here in, in the oh. States. But, um, the shadows were one of the earliest, uh, instrumental bands and they did the original version of apache which has been covered by everybody including some hip-hop groups 
Um, talk a little bit about the shadows and why were they so influential? Well, Cliff Richard and the Shadows, I mean, uh, Cliff, Cliff Richard, for, for people who don't know, you know, he's had more hits in the UK than any other performer. Right. Forget Paul McCartney, forget the Rolling Stones, if you get Electric Like Orchestra or, or anyone else, it's Cliff Richard. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, a lot of their early stuff, yeah. It was, obviously, obviously it was influenced by, uh, well, their, their three idols between them were Buddy Holly, Jerry Lee Lewis and Elvis Presley, and it's like a combination of the three and perhaps a little bit the Everly Brothers, but they, they were the first to come up with a purely British sound. You know, they put all this together, but, you know, in the melting pot, if you like, and then it came out as a, a British sound. And um, and, and they, they were just top, really top instrumentalists, you know. I mean, you know, Hank Marvin you know, was and still is a fantastic player, you know, and, and Jet Harris was a great bass player, you know, and they influenced a lot. I mean, the Beatles uh, later put put them down, but uh, their, their early uh, recording "Cry for a Shadow," pe- people say it's a parody. I think it's partly a tribute as well. Yeah, that, that's, yeah. That's, 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 that's 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 the way I hear it. Yeah, "Cry for a Shadow" was one of the few records that all four um, were on the writing credits. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Pete Best, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that was a very very interesting song. I I, I thought it was. Um, I have it on an album with Tony Sheridan. I, I believe yeah. it's on it. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, I have this original album. Um, I wanted to see if you ever saw that before. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it was first released in Germany, wasn't it? it it's, yeah. It's, it's certainly, it certainly wasn't released in the UK at the time. I believe it was a, as a reissue in the 80s. It was uh, released in the UK. But yeah. Well, I, I think it's an original deck, I think. Yeah, yeah, fantastic, fantastic. I got that one, and I wanted to show you this. This is from um, the Los Kinks. This is a Spanish. Oh, wow, wow. And I, I was able to acquire this um, from a collector. Um, fantastic. So, yeah, so I, I've been collecting that stuff, and I I just thought, you know, whenever I have a chance to collect anything uh, from the Beatles, the Stones, or anybody uh, from England uh, in a different country, I just picked up a Parlophone um Beatles uh, 45 from uh, India. Great, yeah. Uh, I, I must tell you this little story about the Kinks, actually. Uh, I'm a big fan of Joe Lee Lewis, and uh, in 1989, it was around about the time of the Great Balls of Fire movie come out with Dennis Quaid, and he did a bit, so Jerry, Jerry Lee Lewis was very high profile, so he did a big London concert with various guest stars, and I managed to sneak into rehearsal, and Brian May of Queen was sitting there, and, uh, and I chatted to him. He, he's a real gentleman, very nice guy, Brian May. But there was a guy sitting next to him, and I thought, you look, you look familiar, you look familiar. I, I couldn't place him. Later on, on stage, he introduced Brian May, and also on guitar, Dave Davis. It was Dave Davis of the Kinks, and I totally ignored him for five minutes. Oh. I thought, God, I can't, I can't believe it. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, that brings me up to another question. Um, you know, during the days of the 1960s, a lot of musicians... Uh, were under the impetus, their young careers were, they were unknown. Jimmy Page was playing, they actually played guitar on Downtown by Petula Clark, among many other pop records, uh, many with oh, her yes. instruments. But who are some of the other great uh, musicians that started out that way and eventually became stars? Well, yeah, you, you mentioned Jimmy Page, but also John Paul Jones. I, right. I believe he did the uh, arranging of... Uh, She's a Rainbow, the uh, Rolling Stones song. Yeah, he did yeah. arrangements on that. Uh, but, but, uh, Richie Blackmore, of, uh, later of Deep Purple, he was a session player. He was actually a session player for Joe Meek, the, the guy who produced Hines and uh, and the Torn- Tornadoes, uh, Richie Blackmore. Yeah, but, uh, but but so many of them, yeah, yeah. It and, is interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, how about producers, uh, people that produce great albums that may, may kind, of, kind of go under the radar? Well, we all know about George Martin, of course. Yeah, um, that's a difficult one. Uh, I mean, uh, some people say Andrew Lou Golden. Uh, you know, certainly, he knew how to push the uh, push them in the right direction. You know, the Rolling Stones. You know, and, and get, get the best out of them. But whether he was a producer or not, you know, I don't think he knew how to use a console. And nor did Mickey Most. I mean, Mickey Most. You know, he knew how to choose a hit. 
but uh, the animals in the later days, yeah, they spoke about Mickey, Mickey Most, and he, he said Mickey Most didn't have a clue how to actually record anything. Yeah, you know? <laughs> there was other people around him and the band themselves to say, but you can put this here, and Mickey, Mickey's like, oh, really? So, but but he was still a great producer because he could, he knew, you know, he knew that was the take and yeah, that was the song. So it's right. still going to say, what a great producer. Yeah, so. yeah, he had the great ear for it. He just didn't know how to put it on tape, right? Right. Yeah. Now, speaking of the animals, I mean, I thought the animals for their big, uh, their two year career from 64 to 66, they put on a lot of really, really good records. And, and oh, at fantastic. least, yeah, I wasn't a fan of um, House of the Rising Sun. It was a traditional song. It's been around for years. They, yeah, they did a great version of it, but I hear it too much. But, yeah. uh, you know, their version of I'm Crying, um, Club of Go Go, uh, it goes yeah. on and on. You know, uh, we got to yeah. get out of this place. I just yeah. thought they had just a, a great Northern England sound to them. Oh, yeah. I mean, we've got to get out of this place. It was written by Americans, as you know, but, uh, yeah. but, but people uh, listen to it and uh, you know, they think of Newcastle, you know, a, a smoky northern town. And, uh, and, and a similar one, uh, Green Green Grass of Home by Tom Jones. You know, again, you know, an American, American song, but you know, people listen to that and think, oh, oh, he's singing about Wales, obviously, you know, so, you know, where he comes right. from. And, and, that, and, and that's a good thing, you know, when they can put their stamp on that you know, and make it their own and make it sound like they're, they're singing you know, what they know about. Right. And, and Tom Jones, my God, what, a, what an institution. What a long career. I mean, he, he did the She's a Lady. Uh, it's not unusual. It goes on and on. And this guy had his own variety show on Thursday nights in the, U, in the United States here. And he, he just had a, a beautiful voice. He was a good actor. He had it all. And the guests he had on that show, that uh, this is Tom Jones. I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, he didn't have Elvis Presley and he didn't have the Beatles, but he had pretty much everyone else, including all yeah. his idols, you know, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard, you know, all these yeah. guys, you know, Reefa Franklin, you know. Yeah, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, really, really was it. A great TV show. I love watching old clips of that. Yeah. Um, let me throw one more name at you. We'll get to some of your other books I like to speak about. Uh, Sandy Shaw. I don't hear much about her. No, uh, I've got to confess, I'm, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. She, she, is an, she is an icon in the UK. She, she really is. But uh, uh, to, to me, the, the, the three female uh, 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 singers, Dusty Springfield, Lulu and Cilla Black. I think Cilla Black was extremely underrated. I really do. She's you know, very versatile and, and had the personality. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're my world. I mean, but, but Sandy, Sandy Shaw had, had the looks and the fashions and the Carnaby Street fashions. I, I mean, you know, she really was an icon when she was on Ready, Steady, Go. You know, people were like, oh, Sandy Shaw's wearing that. Yeah, so, you know, she, she, she really was an icon. But I'm not a huge fan of her records. I'm just being honest. Yeah. Um, Peter, tell me about some of your other books. I know you've written a lot of them, and I wanted to just uh, touch on that for just a moment. Yeah, I've done, I did one on the uh, American TV show Shindig. Yeah, Shindig was a big one. Jimmy O'Neill. Jimmy O'Neill was yeah. the host of that show. Jimmy O'Neill, yeah, and, and originally produced by Jack Good, who, uh, who, who first, first found his fame, you know, producing, you know, uh, Oh Boy and Boy Meets Girl and, uh, you know, the Six Five Special, you know. What made Shindig such a great show? There were other shows, there were Hullabaloo, there was American Bandstand, um, and shows like that. I know Ready, Steady, Go was big in England, but what made um, you know, what made Shindig such a, a good show and unique? Uh, well, a couple of reasons. It was nearly always live. Uh, although there was back in tracks, there was live vocals, you know, and, and that gave it its edge. Uh, uh, Jack Good really knew how to present as well. You know, he, he, he didn't let a song go on for too long. You know, and, uh, he really knew how to whip up the, the excitement. But also the guests he had. I mean, you know, no other show had the Beatles and the Stones, you know, and James Brown. And, and uh, he was a big fan of uh, the original rock and rollers. So the Every Brothers were on it many times. Chuck Berry was on it. Little Richard, Bo Diddley, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know. And uh, all, all the up and coming soul uh, superstars, yeah, yeah. I've, I've said James Brown, you know, and uh, Tina Turner was on it a lot. All the Motown stars, absolutely, absolutely. You, know, you just look at the guests. I mean, it was it was only around what eighteen months, less than that, right. sixteen months. But, but you just look at all the guests. It, it was absolutely incredible. It yeah. really was. It, it was because you know for eighteen months and it was over in nineteen sixty six. Yeah. Uh, you look at the body of work, my goodness, and it, and it just was swept under the rug. And it was kind of forgotten about. And I wish they would bring it back. I have every episode of it on uh, DVD. 
And, oh, I do too. Yeah. It's yeah. just, a, it's just great. And you go back and watch it, but um, I try to incorporate some of that into my radio show. And, and there's people that just, they have no knowledge other than just a, you know, very small bit of information about the different shows. They don't really know anything about them. I just wish it was like a, we should start an online class about that because there's a lot of people that are much younger than you and I that, that would really benefit from that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Shindig wasn't even shown in the UK and, uh, and it's never been released officially on DVD. Uh, although there's unofficial copies of it, as you know, but uh, there was a, a few VHS tapes re released by Rhino records, uh, about a dozen uh, compilations uh, about 30 years ago but even those wasn't wasn't released in the UK so it's apart from people looking at YouTube or you know older collectors like myself it's, it's very much an unknown in the UK especially so. yeah I, I, I have the ultimate question about this give me the some of the worst records that were ever made that were you know that you had to research Mandy and the Girlfriends. Mandy and the Girlfriends. They they did an album. It's a shame, yeah, you know, that there wasn't many all female groups. Uh, the the Liver Birds. They 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 were they were raw, but they were they were good. I liked the Liver Birds a lot. I, I did I, too. I can't listen to them and watch videos, but but there's one called Mandy and the Girlfriends, and uh, I think it's one of the few in, in there that I give only one star out of five. You know, and, and it, it is pretty terrible, unfortunately. So, yeah, Mandy and the Girlfriends, I'd, I'd go for. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they win the award. Um, Peter, where can people get your books? And which book of all the ones that you've published uh, was the most difficult to uh, complete? Uh, well, first of all, they can get them from Amazon. They're all published through Amazon and sold through Amazon, so very easy to get to. Uh, the, the most difficult one, there was one I did uh, before that called Let's Stomp, and uh, and it's called the, the something like Let's Stomp, the American Rock and Roll that influenced the Brits. But, uh, you know, I'd, 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 I'd come up with, like, a list of Bo Diddley songs, and I'd do all the, all the 60s covers, you know, and, and, uh, and, and talk about those. And that took a lot of work. It really did. You know, that was a, a hard couple of years doing that one. Yeah, uh, Let's Stomp. It wasn't, wasn't a wasn't a great success either but uh, i mean I, I don't do it you know just to make money i'll do it because i enjoy it it's my passions but uh, but i'll say that was the hardest one it really was yeah well i think it's probably the only reason it wasn't a success was because a lot of people didn't know about it and i think the more people know about it the bigger it will be because sometimes things aren't a success not because they're not really excellent it's just that people aren't aware of them and there's so much Absolutely. out there Absolutely. And every time I release a, a new book, you know, and I get a few reviews, it, it always boosts sales and interest in, in the older books, you know, which, which is a good thing. You know, and people say, yeah, oh, I didn't know you wrote that as well. So, so yeah, that, that is a great thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Bo Diddley was a, he was one of the, he had that unique jungle sound to his music, you know, um, he just really had it. And I'm a man, you know, you name it. He, he just did everything well. I, I think Bo Diddley was one of the great rock and roll influences that doesn't get mentioned with Elvis Presley and uh, Buddy Holly and Chuck Berry. Oh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, also influential in the UK, and he's very rarely mentioned in the USA, was Gene Vincent. I mean, you, 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 are, you are someone like Jeff Beck, you know, and you say Gene Vincent and his guitarist, Cliff Gullop. And uh, yeah, yeah, Gene Vincent was very, very influential. He was on TV here a lot from about 1959 to 65 and also toured nonstop. So he, he was very influential in, in the UK and in France. You know, I mean, he's still regarded as, as the rock and roller in France, you know, above Chuck Berry and Jeffrey Lewis. So, uh, but, but very overlooked in the USA, I'd say, Gene Vincent. Yeah. Um, Peter, how did the people of the UK... Um, view the Beatles we viewed them one way how did how did the people in uh, in the UK view them as the icons did they see them as the icons or did they just see them as a really good band uh it's a mixture uh, I, I knew an old uh, teddy boy you know what a teddy boy is like an old uh, rock and roller a nice yeah. hat by the way <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, a teddy boy. They, they, they wore like a long, long red jackets or green jackets, bright coloured jackets and tight trousers. Anyway, I knew someone from Wales and uh, a very good friend. He, he died a few years ago, but uh, but he, he, he loved you know, the old rock and rollers, you know, Jeff Lee Lewis and Gene Vincent and all that. But he always dubbed the Beat Beatles the Beatless. 
<laughs> as if they had no real beat. They didn't have the beat that he liked. You know, so so they wasn't university at all. You know, that, that would be a shame. But but, but most people loved them, including including myself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Beatles originally they were um some of their on some of the records they were misspelled it was B E E not B E A. Yeah. So, so I have I have some records that actually had the, a misspelling of that. And you think about the Beatles' career, and this has been um, you know went over and over by many people, but such a short time and, and, and all of a sudden you know from 1965 to 67 that sound changed dramatically with rubber soul and revolver and then all of a sudden we they stopped touring in august of 66 and then all of a sudden we get sergeant pepper yeah, we get the magical yeah, mystery yeah. tour we get all this stuff in such a short period of time and it's so dramatically different um i don't think there's any been any band that's been able to write so many hits and continue their career and just be on top pretty much the whole time no, I, I mean, uh, one group I particularly like uh, is, is uh, the Hollies in, in the days when Graham Nash were with them. And, and, and they, were, they, were, they were very in, innovative as well. But, but the, the Hollies, the Rolling Stones and all that, as, as John Lennon used to say, you know, they, whatever the, uh, the Beatles did, the Rolling Stones did it six months later. And the Beatles were just so, so ahead of the curve. They really were all the way through the 60s. They were incredible. But having said that, my, my favourite Beatles album by far, A Hard Day's Night, I, I just love it. It's just, it's just, it's just joyful. It's just exciting. It's right. a, and it's, and it's John, it's John Lennon's album. You know, I think there's only about three lead vocals by Paul McCartney, and they wrote every song on it. You know, it's, I, Hard Day's Night's an incredible album. It really is. I'd, I'd much rather listen to a Hard Day's Night and Help to a certain extent than Abbey Road. I really would. Yeah, I mean, uh, I should have known better. I think was one of the greatest songs they ever did. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and uh, John Lennon's vocal is just so raw in it, any time at all. And when I, yeah, you know, uh, when I get home and things like that, you can't do that. You know, his voice is incredible on that. Yeah, really yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a, yeah great songs. Right. And obviously, yeah, they were under so much pressure at the time. Yeah, they were touring nonstop. Yeah, you know, they they were they were making the movie. They was on you know, on on their radio shows, but they still managed to write these thirteen great songs. You know, it's, 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 it's yeah. unbelievable, really, really. You think about how hard it is to write a, a song, not only a song, but a hit song. And then you write the words to it. I've talked to Jimmy Webb, who's a great American songwriter. And, you know, Jimmy wrote MacArthur Park and Wichita Lineman. And, you know, by the time I get to Phoenix, I interviewed him. And, you know, it, it's difficult to not only write a good song, but to write a hit song. And that's really yeah. rare because, uh, and to be able to do that time after time after time, that is almost like you're... Um, divine interventions coming in to help you oh it, it really is it really is yeah 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 <laughs> yeah uh, it, it's interesting how uh, people you know at first didn't even see themselves as uh, songwriters you know you know john lennon paul mccartney were writing songs you know, at a very very young age before they were famous but for instance you know andrew lou goldman who i mentioned earlier said to mick and keith right you've got to write songs and, uh, and keith in particular said yeah i'm not a songwriter i'm a guitarist i play this chuck berry stuff he said right well, you're not coming out this room until you do and then forced them and, and then obviously the rolling stones wrote you know a lot of classic records all throughout the 60s so and, sure. and beyond sure i i uh, when i spoke to peter asher he says that he was at home with paul mccartney and paul wrote i want to hold your hand on piano <laughs> isn't that amazing <laughs> to think he wrote that on a that piano is. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know it was on, written on piano. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just that's what that's what he told me. It's like, can you imagine being at home? You're you're a young man, and all of a sudden, Paul calls you into the uh, the other room, and he says, "I got this new song," and you're going, "Oh, wow, it's not bad," you know. And then it turns out to be you know one of the biggest songs of all time, you know. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, there's a story that, uh, and I'm sure it's true that Billy J. Kramer uh, often tells, and uh, and uh, and, uh, you know, it, it had a few big hit records by Lennon McCartney. And th then the career started going down a little bit, 64, 65. And then Paul McCartney said, I've got some songs for you. And then one of them he played uh, was uh, was Yesterday. And and uh, you know, Billy J. Crow, that is fantastic. And Paul said, yeah, but I'm keeping that one for myself. Yeah. <laughs> Which was called Scrambled Eggs, I believe, originally. Scrambled Eggs, of course. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And, and we mentioned uh, the Hollies before um, they did a version of Bus Stop, which Peter Noon told me that Bus Stop was he, he had that was their song first. It was a bomb. And then the Hollies did it, which was just a big hit for them. Yeah, 
I mean, the Her Herman's Hermits, again, a group I, I really like, but, uh, but they were more bubbly and jolly. But you listen to their version of Bus Stop, you know, it's almost depressing compared to the Hollies. You, you, you almost think he doesn't get the girl at the end when you hear, hear Peter Newton singing <laughs> Bus Stop. You know, it's like, yeah. 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 Well, Dandy, too. They, they did a good version of Dandy, which um, the Kinks also did. So, you know, it's yeah. um, but Peter is still on tour in the U.S. And I've met Peter a couple of times. I find Peter Noon is one of the most astute musicians I'd ever uh, come in contact with. His IQ is like 160. It's just he remembers almost every detail of his career. And he's like 72 now. I don't doubt it. Uh, the, the first book I published, actually, it was uh, about four years ago now, called Channel in the Beat. And it was on a... Uh... On, on TV, you know, 60s TV shows and that. And I actually wrote to a couple of people, asked if they'd do a forward. And uh, and Peter Newman was one of the ones who responded. And he did a fantastic thing. And and it was so humbling for me, you know, because I, I was just this, this un, completely unknown writer, never published a book. And he wrote uh, wrote to him. And within a few days, well, he, he wrote back the same day and said, give me a week, I'll have something for you. And he did. And I thought that, that was just so nice, you know. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm a nobody now, but yeah, I was really a nobody then. Yeah, and it's it's just so nice. You know, someone's got the time for people like that. Right, he's a very kind and generous and magnanimous person, and I found him to be like I sat in a dressing room before a show with him one time. I didn't really say much because I don't like to bother musicians before they go on stage. But Peter would just just talk, you know, just randomly, just say whatever came to his mind first. And and it's just interesting. He brought up John Lennon, and the first time John Lennon gave him a drink. So. Oh. Yeah, he was like, he was well underage at the time. And and John was uh, just, you know, can you imagine you're, you're 16 or 17 years old and <laughs> there's John Lennon who's already established just buying you drinks and you're thinking, wow, what a, this is, I can't believe it. I've made uh, a recall that stuff. I also made a recall him, uh, it might be in an interview on YouTube, that Keith Richards told told Peter Noon not to take drugs. Yeah. <laughs> You know, he said, don't take drugs, don't take drugs. <laughs> this is Keith Richards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's good advice. Don't take drugs. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Peter Chexfield, our special guest, great author from the UK. Uh, Peter, let's run down your books again so people can get them. Yeah, uh, well, they can get them from uh, Amazon, you know, worldwide from Amazon. But yeah, uh, I've got Shindig, Top of the Pops, uh, Having a rave up, uh, let's stomp, channeling the beat. I've got about nine books out there, so yeah, yeah. Peter, I'd like to have you on again and talk about some of your other books. Uh, it's really been a pleasure speaking with you. Um, thank you so much for your time. Likewise, thank you, Ray. Thank you. Uh, you were excellent, and I wish you the very, very, very best. Thank you. I do appreciate that. All right. Thank you, and uh, I'll be in contact. And uh, great job. Thank you very much, Ray. Take care of yourself. Bye bye.